Hello and welcome back. In this video we will start reading about section 3.2 in our book. And before you start watching this video, you should have read section 3.1 of the book. And I would suggest that you also read section 3.2 up to 3.2.3 before you watch these videos. There is another subsection 3.2.4. You can leave reading that until after you have watched the videos, because that is a slightly more specialized topic. So again, you should have read everything until section 3.2.3. And once you have done that, we can start our discussion. Let's see what we have here. The first subsection will be rather short, and there we will just remember how to compute a Monte Carlo estimate. That's what we already learned in section 3.1. And I will discuss some technical issues relating to memory use of computers and practical aspects of computing it. Then the meat of chapter 3.2 is in section 3.2.2 and 3.2.3, where we consider the error of Monte Carlo estimates. And based on that, we will finally address how we should choose the sample size capital N. And then the final section 3.2.4, will be about some more specialized aspects, namely a more clever way of determining error bounds for the estimate. But let's start at the beginning. So section 3.2.1. In this section, we will recall how a Monte Carlo estimate is actually computed. So the mathematical formula we have seen in the last section is Zn Monte Carlo is 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of xj, and that is an approximation for the expectation f of x we want to compute. And in this formula, x is a given random variable and f is a given function. We get to pick them before we start. And the xj are what I called iid copies of x. That is independent random variables, each of which has the same distribution as x has. And as part of the algorithm, we need to generate these xj. So let me just write that. We need to generate the xj. Then the next step is normally trivial. We need to apply f to get fj. And finally, we need to compute the average to the 1 over n sum j from 1 to n. Good. So let me change it to a different color. The first topic, need to generate the xj, we will cover that in greater detail chapter 1, that we will do that after chapter 3, so for now I just write chapter 1. And the reason we can get away with this is that R has many built-in functions to generate random numbers, so I showed you R norm and R unif in the last videos. R norm is one function, R unif is another function, and there are many more. So, for now, we just use these functions, but for more complicated things, we need to use later what we will learn in chapter one. Okay, applying f depends on f, but this is often a simple function. So once we have these numbers, applying f will not be a problem. And finally, we need to compute the average, and that can be a problem just for the reason that n is very large. A lot of memory may be needed to store x1 up to xn. Well, so far we have experimented with using a million numbers and a computer can easily store a million floating point numbers, but each floating point number takes eight bytes. So that will be about eight megabytes of memory used. And it is not hard to come across situations where you'd rather use a billion numbers and then we already are looking into gigabytes of memory. So at some point that could turn into a problem. And there is a very simple trick, namely what we really want is let me just flip back the page, is just the sum. So instead of doing it how I wrote, like I wrote it at the bottom of this page to generate x1 to xn first and then compute the average, what we could do is we could generate these numbers just one by one and add them all up. To save memory, we could sum up the values as we generate them. And in the book, I wrote that in form of an algorithm where I wrote down the steps. That goes along the lines, we use some value where we store the sum, so let's say s, and we initialize this to zero, and then for j from 1 up to n, what we do is generate 
xj and set s equal to the old s plus f of xj and then the result is s over n because s contains the sum and sum over n is what we want to compute. So that works. And you see here there is no need to know all of the sj at once, so we don't need to store them. So we could get away with generate one x, add it to s, generate another x, add it to s. So this method will use much, much, much less memory than the naive implementation where we first generate all xj and then take the sum. The downside is this contains a loop here. And loops in many programming languages, in particular in R, are somewhat slow, so that method will be slower than the direct message. There is some balance to be made. It uses less memory, but it's slower. So in practice, you need to see if it fits into your memory, you should use the naive method, just generating all x and using mean. But if you run out of memory, you may consider methods like this. And there is actually an intermediate step. Namely, you could generate the values in batches let's say 10,000 at a time, and then for each batch compute the sum and add it up and then have a loop which goes over batches, then the loop does not need to take so many steps and doesn't slow down things so much and you still get up to very large values like it's of, or hundreds of millions. Good, so that problem we can solve. There is a second variant of this problem which will come across. Namely, we will soon see that it's also useful to know the sample variance of the f of xj, not just the average, but the sample variance. Let me write that. We will also need to compute the sample variance of the f of xj. And the formula for the sample variance, it's often written as s squared, so s squared f of xj maybe. That's not standard notation, but it's some possible notation that is 1 over n minus 1 sum j from 1 to n f of xj minus the average let's call that f of x bar maybe squared so that's the standard formula of the sample variance where this f of x bar is just notation i introduced it for here for the average of the f of xj so that is 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of xj. And that if you look at it, I wrote it here now because it appears as a part of the formula for the sample variance, but that is also identical to the Monte Carlo estimate we want to compute, so that value we will have. But if you look at this formula, it very much looks like we would again need to store all of the xj because only after we are done we will know what is the average of the f of xj. So to compute this part, we will need to have generated them all already. And then that goes into the formula where we still need all of the f of xj. So it looks a bit like we would need to store them all, which again would lead into memory problems potentially. But it turns out there is a trick. And the trick is an alternative formula for the sample variance, which gives numerically the same answers. 1 over n minus 1, sum j from 1 to n, f of xj squared minus n over n minus 1 and then the average of the xj squared so sum j from 1 to n divided by n of f of xj and that expression squared. You can check these two formulas always give the same answer and the second formula looks very much like an average again so we can use the same trick again so what we could do is now we need two variables we could use s is zero, we use this for the sum, and say t is zero, we use this for the sum of squares, and then for j from 1 to n, we generate xj, we compute f of xj, and then we do s is replaced with s plus f of xj, that's going to be the sum of the f of xj and then the average, and t, I'm going back a page, will be used for the first term here, for this term. And this term we need the sum of the squares of f of xj. So what we can do is t is the old t plus f of xj squared. And using that, after we have run through the loop, s will now contain the sum of the f of xj. t will contain the sum of the f of xj squared. So then we have zn mc we can work out as s over n. 
and the sample variance, I just write S squared here, that's going to be the sample variance, will be something computed from S and T. So let's go back. We need the sum of the squares over n minus 1. So T over n minus 1. And then we need minus n over n minus 1, the average squared. So minus n over n minus 1, and the average, we could, for example, write Z n m c squared. Using this trick, we have now simultaneously computed the mean of the f of xj and the sample variance of the f of xj. In the next section, we will see how the sample variance of the f of xj can be used as part of the method to estimate the estimation error, so to assess how close that nmc is to the true expectation of f of x. This completes section 3.2.1. In the following two subsections, 3.2.2 and 3.2.3, we will learn about the error of Monte Carlo estimates, and I will record that in a separate video.